the Ukrainian question simply left its position as number one priority on the EU political map. And also uh, the news about fight uh, around Donbass are not the current headlines. The violence is relatively contained, even if this is an extraordinary and extremely dangerous situation with that frozen conflict and with sustained and continuing Russia intervention there. So I think it's good that the organizers have opted to include a panel on Ukraine at this conference and especially in the context of European Union and its possibilities to influence it. Well, the panel should review the European response. It means does the EU possess effective tools to uh, somehow to help Ukraine in its European perspectives and in how far is EU able and prepared and willing to respond to destructive Russian policies. Actually, there are much more questions for the panelists in the internal communication, but there were so many questions it would require at least three conferences. Well, let me add at the beginning very briefly a couple of introductory remarks to this agenda. I think it is true first that for many scholars and observers, there is an impression that both diplomatic and political efforts in the last months were focused predominantly on Minsk agreements, what is understandable, but it's not enough. I think it's clear and evident that Ukraine has entered another era. Uh, it is era when it has to cope with uh, post Donbas reality and with everything else. But uh, according to Jana Kobzova, who wrote about it, Ukraine is engaged not only in, in this hybrid war, but also in another war. I mean, a war about and on reforms. It doesn't mean that nothing has been achieved, let it be the reform of the security sector, let it be the first steps in pension reforms. It means increasing the age of retirement and, and removing the benefits for pensioners who are working. Let it be the changes in banking sector. Some banks were uh, simply declared as <coughs> non-functioning and the other banks were, were more transparent. Uh, I think there are also there was a fight about tax reforms, by the way, prepared with the contribution of the former Deputy Prime Minister of Slovakia, Ivan Miklos, who wrote a very critical article about his disappointments with the way how it was handled, uh, namely and concretely that uh, in the camp of uh, current rulers, there was another alternative, uh, alternative proposal for tax reform. He says that it's not the usual procedure that the same party or the supporters of the same party are proposing another, another, their alternative proposal and there are problems with it. However, I think one of the most urgent and uh, most tough issue, it means the corruption and inefficient, uh, inefficient governance in Ukraine is evidently here on the scene. We, we heard in, in the speech of Vice President Timmerman that there was, a <clears throat> there was a sentence about Turkey and EU and refugees. And he said it's absolutely clear that neither Turkey nor the European Union can do it alone. They can do it only together. So my question also to panelists is that if this is also the case in Ukraine and how they, how they see it. We, we are happy to have three panelists uh, uh, which will offer First, the Ukrainian perspective, then the EU perspective, and then the perspective of, a, of someone who is not uh, in the EU but could talk and reflect about it from a, from a more distance. So, and, and I'm glad that, uh, that um, uh, two first of our speakers were involved not only as, as, as scholars and as researchers, but also were involved in the in the NGO sector. In case of Irina, I think you worked with the Open Society Fund and David Stolik was involved in the, in the Czech NGO sector. So the first we will ask Irina Solomenko, then uh, David Stolik and then, then Esla Toye, who by the way, uh, I think has 
good perspectives for it because he is a well-known author of the book called The European Union as a Small Power. So we will see what does it mean if we, for instance, need a more transatlantic involvement, he will tell us. So, uh, because you are only three, you have more time to, at the beginning, it doesn't have to be only five minutes, it can be longer, then you will respond to each other, and then obviously the floor will be open for your questions, comments, or remarks. So, Elena, please. Thank you very much, it's my pleasure to be here, thank you for the invitation. I would like to make a few points, and the first, uh, in the first point, I would like to outline the context, because often when we talk about the situation in Donbass, uh, it's often portrayed as a Ukraine crisis, especially in the German media, but everywhere as well. And I think that we deal here with three crises, and we have to bear it in mind. Firstly, of course, there is a Ukraine crisis, but not in the sense of a civil war, it is, as it is often also man, meant in German media, for instance. But um, uh, the crisis of state building, crisis of well governance, but this is not a, a news. This has been a problem for the past 25 years. The second crisis uh, we deal with is Russia crisis, right? So, um, as I mentioned, my question is the biggest panel, but I think we still ho don't have a clear vision of uh, where is Russia moving and what are we going to do with Russia um, in um, if it's going to become a country isolated or aggressive and also. So there is clearly, there, um, I mean, the, the Nobel Prize winner uh, of this year, she called this the Versailles complex, right? Because Russia, Russia used to be an empire, then it lost its strengths, and now it's kind of trying to rebuild its, its strengths in the national, its national arena. So how is the EU and the world going to react to this? And the second crisis is, of course, the crisis of the international institutions and uh, the ability of the EU to react to this. Uh, what I see now, I mean, Crimea, Crimea was annexed, and what I see now, the sanctions the EU agreed on are linked to the solution of the situation in Donbass and the uh, implementation of the Minsk Agreement. But uh, what, is, what is going to happen with Crimea? There's, not, there's no conditionality regarding Crimea. And if we look at the situation in Crimea, the Crimean Tatars, the ethnic group which, was, which appeared in Crimea, and they, don't have no other, they have no other land to go. And there are, according to Crimean Tatars themselves who live in mainland Ukraine, they, say, they claim it's a holocaust or... Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a... I mean, uh, maybe it's not a good term, but, but uh, they're facing uh, extreme pressure in terms of human rights. So the people are disappearing during the nights and... Um, if this is problem is not tackled, after five, ten years, there might not be Crimean Tatars as, a, as an ethnic group anymore, you know? So, so um, th this is all something to be dealt with. Um, so we have to bear in mind that there is uh, this uh, multidimensionality of crises. If we come to Ukraine and speak about Ukraine proper, uh, um, I would like to give an idea of what kind of challenges Ukraine is facing. Because if, uh, we often talk about the experience of Central East European countries, and I remember in the 90s, people were saying that it's a challenge of transformation because it's a triple transformation. The countries had to undertake state building, um, undertake um, uh, market economy reforms, uh, democratization. But what we see in Ukraine now, apart from the fact that Ukraine has to undertake all these reforms, which it has not undertaken since um, its independence, uh, we also have the um, situation of a captured state in Ukraine. So basically, there is a state which um, is is actually under the control of uh, a few individuals, if you know. There is no this uh, tradition of inclusive policy making. This is not the case in Central East European countries, but this is the case in Ukraine. And uh, if we think about this captured state, if we look at how situations developed during the Maidan, when it was enough to give a for one person to take a decision, and then the whole law enforcement apparatus, the whole police apparatus was used to suppress the protesters. This says uh, to what extent it was a capture state, to what extent uh, public institutions were controlled by a few individuals and still are, in a sense. So this uh, um, gives us an idea of what's tr uh, how strong the resistance is uh, for reforms which are to be implemented in Ukraine. Now, if we look at what has been happening after the Maidan, um, uh, some reforms have been undertaken, mostly at the level of initiating some legislation, 
Uh, for instance, uh, there is a lot of transparency in terms of public finance. People can follow online uh, um, what is happening with the state budget, not only on central level, but also the local levels. Public procurement has become transparent and uh, it eliminates possibilities of corruption. There is public broadcasting. This has never been the case because most TVs are controlled by oligarchs and this is a, another model which is very positive. Um, there, is a, there, is a, um, there are plans of demonopolization and privatization of um, many state enterprises, which also was a big uh, opportunity for corruption. So there are, there are many things which have uh, happened, but um, uh, the results have been, uh, there have been, been many results, and firstly because uh, the, the biggest problem is probably the fact that uh, law enforcement um, uh, prosecution, judiciary system, they're still very much um, the old, uh, they are still very much old, they have not been reformed and, and uh, um, uh, if there are, even if there are a lot of corruption scandals and there is a lot of investigative journalism and people know e even about the fact that uh, the president himself um, has some, is using his position to en enrich himself to some extent even now, uh, there is no, um, there are no authorities and no capacity to follow up on this. So nobody has been brought to justice. There, there have been a few cases, but the uh, they smell of selective justice. Yeah, there is no comprehensive approach to that. And so, of course, there is. Uh, that's why there is a lot of disillusionment. If you look at public opinion polls, um, um, majority of people, over 70%, think that that reforms are not taking place. That countries are moving in the wrong direction. But there are also positive aspects. Uh, for instance, uh, there is a very strong civil society pressure. This has never been the case uh, before. And uh, this is uh, something which gives a lot of hopes um, and strong investigative journalism. So um, if, uh, if, even if nobody has been brought to justice uh, yet, uh, we know that there are the, we know all the corruption cases, more or less, and uh, all the details, all the names and the amounts is very positive. So there are a lot of uh, investigative journalism portals and online uh, TVs and so on. Uh, when the, the, the society is setting an agenda for the government, so for instance, there's a platform reanimation package of reforms, they come to the parliament every week and say, this is the plan for the week, please follow this loss. If uh, things are not happening, they organize demonstrations, they media campaign and so on. Uh, also, civil society has been able to uh, involve international institutions to strengthen their con conditionality. The fact that um, anti-corruption bureau was set up in Ukraine, it has not started working yet, but it's a very important institution which is going to deal with high-level corruption cases. The, the very fact that it was um, uh, uh, established was because the International Monetary Foundation included uh, the creation of this bureau as a condition for uh, disbursement of a grant of a tranche uh, to, to Ukraine of its financial assistance. This is one of the cases what civil society has been able to do. Also, uh, re uh, public opinion in Ukraine is very pro-European now. Uh, if we, before we faced a division between, uh, let's say, Western Ukraine, roughly speaking, and Eastern Ukraine. In Eastern Ukraine, um, more people supported accession to customs union with Russia, Belarus, Belarus and Kazakhstan and Armenia. Um, now that we see that all over Ukraine, the, the um, majority of people want to join European Union. I mean, not over 50 percent, but more of those. There, uh, there are more people who want to join European U Union rather than customs union. Uh, although in Eastern Ukraine, there is about 30 percent of people who are undecided. So there is also a big portion of people um, who still have to make up their mind. And it's only in these territories which are occupied by separatists, so to, so, so to say, and now uh, again under Ukrainian control, it's only there that support for customs union is a bit maybe more than, than that for uh, EU. So Ukraine is predominantly, has become predominantly pro-European, and uh, there was also a poll which says that Ukrainians still believe that democracy is the best model. Uh, this also gives a hope, and also if you look at what in the public opinion polls, what priority reforms Ukrainians can see there as priority. Those are uh, law enforcement um, and corruption, not social reforms, despite the fact that there is a very bad economic crisis which affected practically every household. Um, so I think I'll stop here and uh, okay. we'll continue. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much also for mentioning this lack of comprehensiveness. For instance, uh, I mentioned the reform in the security sector. Yes, the Ukrainians were able radically uh, to change all the heads of police stations, uh, local and regional, 
But then besides police, there is also prosecutor general and courts and judges. And the reform there is unfortunately not progressing appropriately. Well, we have here one of the very visible figures on, on, from, Europe, from Europe in Ukraine. Uh, I think we are hearing that EU has more people in Ukraine uh, who are doing their job. It means probably we, we know more about Ukraine. There is an increase of knowledge. Does it also mean that there is a possible increase of influence in calling Ukrainians to, to deliver, especially in reforms and everything what is connected to it? Yes, uh, <coughs> thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to speak here. And, uh, I'm still puzzled because I'm supposed to present the EU perspective while I came from Kiev. Irina was supposed to present the Ukrainian perspective. She came from Berlin. And uh, I just decided that I would use a very fashionable tactic uh, just to, to do my presentation. It's a tactics of hybrid war. Officially, I'm on the leaf. So I'm here as a private person. In my real life over back there, I'm also like representing the EU. But uh, now the, the mic sort of a dilemma is whether you want to hear a real story or the official lines, right? <laughs> so that's why I'm on the leave. If, if, if somebody it's has the rhetoric, questions. It's the rhetoric question. It's rhetoric. Because of course we yeah. want to hear the, and, the real story. Yeah, and the second thing uh, what I liked very much yesterday about the last panel when uh, Jirka Schneider said that in times of crisis, if you want to be a human, you have to break rules. And this is my golden phrase that I will probably frame in my office. And I will also use it as an explanation when uh, we have a new sort of, let's say, tense moment in our office. Uh, and, but I decided not to be too outspoken. So what I'm going to do, I will pose questions to you, rhetoric questions. On some questions, I will even un provide my own answers, probably. So the first question is, what is the <laughs> obvious question? What is the EU? What is the EU perspective? Is it the perspective of institutions, or is it the perspective of EU taxpayers, EU citizens? And this is a sort of a dilemma that we also have uh, being in Kiev, being on ground, because we who are there in those times of crisis, we really felt, we have felt a strong need to defend these European values. I think what we've saw, what we've seen on the streets of Kiev and other cities, people with European flags, being shot, we realized what these values are. So I think that I'm a I'm, I'm pretty legitimate representative of the EU in terms of these, let's say, community of values. So the questions, the our side is a very simple questions, obvious questions. So what has happened in March 2013 with Crimea? Was it a breach of international law or not? Was it the first time after the Second World War that somebody decided to simply change the post-war uh, geopolitical map? Yes. Are these 45 humanitarian, so-called humanitarian convoys entering illegally every second week the territory of a sovereign European country? Isn't it also a breach of the international law? These humanitarian, so-called humanitarian convoys are not checked by International Federation of the Red Cross, they are not checked by Ukrainian custom officers. They are not checked by the OEC. Where is the response of the international community? Mm. Next question. Imagine you are citizens or inhabitants of a small city that is very close to the border of your neighbor. Let's take Ostrava or Brno. The inhabitants of these cities don't like people from Prague, right? And suddenly, imagine one day, there is a group of masked men, perfectly trained. You see that they have worked for special forces, and they suddenly occupy the city hall. And they speak some sort of Czech, but with words that we don't use in the Czech Republic. What is going to happen? Will the legitimate Czech government start negotiations? If the international community tells the Czech government you have to listen to their legitimate concerns, be involved in a sort of a dialogue. Will the Czech government listen to them? No. They will defend the legal order. They will defend the rule of law in the country. And the response will be pretty tough. Just another question. Uh, 
The question related to Minsk agreement. Uh, uh, do you think that the... Uh, There's a famous question from 2013. Does the EU have a plan B? <laughs> do you believe that Minsk is implementable? Part of the Minsk is, for example, that all the leaders of the so-called uh, separatists mm -hmm. will have an impunity, they will be a subject to amnesty. Do you believe that Ukraine and public opinion will swallow this? Do you believe that Russia will voluntarily surrender the control of the border between these two republics, so-called republics, mm -hmm. and Russia? Do you believe that the ceasefire is being held? I just read the report of the special monitoring mission of the OECE for today. 11 cases of violation of a ceasefire. There is a mass up of troops on the other side of the border. That's what the OEC is reporting. The OEC still doesn't have a full access to all parts of the occupied territories. Do you think that the ceasefire will be holding? The question was about frozen conflict. It's another question. Who is interested in freezing this conflict? Is it the EU? No. Is it Ukraine? No. Is it Russia? And that's a very important question. Why it all has happened? Why Russia suddenly has become so, I would say, inversive in its neighborhood uh, region? And the answer is simple, and I can just answer that question. Uh, Russia doesn't want to see Ukraine as a success story. Mm -hmm. Russia doesn't want to have Ukrainian uh, society to be so pro-European as it is. But what Ira said, the public opinion polls are exactly contrary. Uh, the support for the EU, and what is very interesting, for the NATO, for the NATO yeah. is growing. Mm -hmm. Right now, Ukrainians, if they go to the referendum, they will vote in favor of the NATO membership. Two years ago, there were only 14% of Ukrainians who wanted to join NATO. So you see that Russia is not achieving its geopolitical policy goals. So do you think that the conflict will be frozen? That's another question. Uh, yeah. Another very interesting thing is, uh, at the EU position, and uh, High Rep Mogherini, when she was on Monday in Kiev, she stressed it several times, we expect Ukraine to adopt the constitutional changes in the second reading by the end of the year. Uh, have you heard what has happened when the changes were being voted for the first time on the 31st of August? One radical, one really like narrow-minded person threw a hand grenade at the police. He killed four people. Do you think that the Ukrainian society, the public opinion, is ready to make such concessions and would allow the parliament to change the constitution? Let me remind one thing. Minsk agreements are not part of the international law. These are the agreements among four leaders. Does a leader of one single country has, have a right to claim there that his parliament will vote on constitutional changes? Out of these four leaders, I know only one leader who can just guarantee that. So do we want Ukrainians, Ukrainian parliament, to vote on something that is so much opposed in the society? Where are our values? Where are the boundaries of parliamentary democracy, or presidential parliamentary mm -hmm. democracy? Uh, sort of another question would be, I mean, we know who is pushing for these constitutional changes. And it must be, let's say, kept separate from decentralization, because this is indeed what the EU has been suggesting to Ukraine a long time ago. You have to change, you know, the setup of your a country of your, you have to basically follow the principle of subsidiarity. But now this sort of a concept is being used also for granting special status and special rights to, to uh, self-declared republics. And we know what the demands from other sides are. Here my question is, and I'm also asking in, in informal discussions my question to my Ukrainian colleagues, when Ukraine will present its own proposals for the amendment of the constitution of Russian, Russian Federation? It's a legitimate question. If this change, these changes can be proposed on the other side, what, why not in the other side? Russia is the federation as well. Do, is it a real federation? 
do the federal districts have, you know, real autonomy, real powers? This is interesting. So why not then Venice Commission advises <coughs> Russia how to, you know, modern its constitution? We are not discussing these issues. And now the last thing, uh, EU response. And uh, since I deal with media, uh, quite often we are asked by our hierarchy and headquarters to communicate Europe, to communicate EU policy on Ukraine. And if you attend any simple training on communication, the basic, uh, basic sort of a guideline is uh, you can communicate uh, the policy, if you have a policy. Now my question is, does the EU have a policy towards Ukraine, towards Russia? I mean, what sort of policy should I communicate, right? We have a least common denominator in that policy, and this is a policy of unrecognition of Crimea, mm -hmm. illegal annexation of Crimea, the package of sanctions. And I would say this is already a pretty important achievement. Frankly speaking, uh, many of us were rather surprised that it was possible mm -hmm. to find this lowest common denominator on the European level. But still, do we have a policy towards Russia, towards <clears throat> Ukraine, to I mean, towards... Uh, uh, refugee crisis. I mean, following the, you know, the debates here from yesterday. So I will not comment on the EU response so far, even though I could. Uh, so the real response to the crisis, uh, that's a sort of a sign of an optimism, would come, as Ira said, from uh, Ukrainian society. What you said, like uh, active civil, uh, civil society, investigative journalists, these are the people that are really changing their country. And I must say that uh, very often we learn from them what it means to be European, what it means to believe in European values. And that society is pretty strong. And I think that this sort of a new source of energy, of a renewal of European values, uh, really can happen, happen in, in Ukraine. And this is the hope, which is linked also to the mm. issue of the reforms. We can also discuss it quite, for a quite long time. And last thing, what I'm always stressing at such gatherings, Russia. I mean, when we say Russia, uh, we should define it rather clearly. This is a Putin's Russia. Uh, because, you know, not, not everybody in Russia is, like, very content with what is happening with their country. And a uh, month ago, former EC president Barroso was in Kiev, and I really envy him because he was now free of, you know, these formalities and everything, <laughs> official line. And he was asked a question about his uh, negotiations with Mr. Putin. And he said, like, uh, the problem in Europe is, well, in general, problem is that we all try to think what is the Putin's motivation, what his goals are, what is he going to do next. And he said, this is a wrong approach. We should make Mr. Putin to follow our policy, our agenda. <laughs> and that's it. And, and I will come back, I'll come back to my first point. And that policy is to make Mr. Putin to respect international law. Thank you. <clears throat> David, thank you very much. Uh, and we probably could go on when you were asking uh, who is the EU. One of the recent illustrations of the paradoxical situation is this attempt to build the Nord Stream 2, which practically will deprive Ukraine of the sufficient amount of money because it will not go through Ukraine. And it's done by one, I'm not saying by the state, it's done by private business of one of the most important EU states, Germany. And if, they, if you ask German politicians, they say, well, it's, it's not a political issue, it's just business. Why should we decide about it? So it's non-decision about it means a decision, and decision means a loss for Ukraine. You said, you said that there is still a strong community of pro-European values, and in fact, Russians willingly or not, have contributed to the creation of this Ukrainian political nation and even, even to this uh, European-oriented political society. Well, but Russia, unfortunately, is playing a much dangerous role, and I'd like to hear from our Norwegian colleague to, to enter the stage and to present his there's a, there's a contradiction Comment. in terms, uh, and Norwegian to comment upon Europe. Uh, I come from the peripheries. Uh, I would uh, perhaps attempt to, to lift our, our views a little bit. 
In the lead up to the um, Iraq war, uh, uh, it, is, it is said that Prime Minister Blair came up with the idea that he wanted to end one of his speeches by saying, and God bless Great Britain, and he was told by his advisers, we do not do God. And uh, the EU doesn't, and the Brits, the British don't do God, and the EU doesn't do geopolitics. And the problem for the EU not being very interested in geopolitics is that geopolitics have a tendency to work whether we're interested in them or not. When we're looking uh, from an eagle's eye perspective on what has happened in the last couple of years, we see the neighborhood policies of the European Union are now in tatters. Most of the regimes that we were cooperating with on the south side of the Mediterranean Sea is no longer in office. And most of these countries are not countries we can work with anymore. We see that Turkey has managed to push its membership application further in the last three months than it had in the previous 30 years through being uh, very unhelpful towards Europe uh, by allowing migrants to use its shores as a depart departing point. When it comes to the question of, of Ukraine, uh, I'm not very sanguine. Uh, it seems that Europe uh, only can deal with one crisis at the time, and that currently it's the migration crisis that is drawing up most of the, the energy. And when it comes to the dealings in the Ukraine, we don't even know what is the purpose of the EU. What does the EU want to achieve? Not towards Ukraine, we know, we know what they want to, uh, to achieve versus Ukraine, but what about Russia? What is the, uh, the, policy, uh, the purpose of EU policies in Russia? Is it containment? Is it pushback? Is it bridge building? We don't know. <laughs> um, it seems uh, that the EU seeks to, to get to, to the, its preferred modus operandi, which is modeling through. And it wants to get back to, a new, uh, back to normality as soon as possible. The problem is that we're not living in normal times. Mm -hmm. And uh, it doesn't seem that we will have normality because Russia, what Russia has done is to break mm -hmm. the deep peace in Europe. They have broken the most fundamental rule that we have for interaction among states in our part of the world and globally. And that is that you do not invade neighboring countries, you don't, do not annex parts of neighboring countries, and you don't uh, ferment armed rebellions in neighboring countries. So, let's, let's take that big step back and ask ourselves, is, the, is Ukraine the EU's responsibility? And I have to say, no, it is not. Ukraine is not the responsibility of the EU. Ukraine is the responsibility of the Ukrainians. But the EU has uh, an obligation, I believe, to support those who embraces the values of Europe and who wants to be part of Europe. And that places uh, the EU into a direct contest with Russia, who has a competing interest in Ukraine. Vladimir Putin he visited the Bucharest summit of NATO in 2008, and he had a rather lengthy, lengthy speech. It's not on record, but I've spoken to some of the people who attended the, uh, the proceedings. And Putin spent very much of his time uh, complaining about what he saw as uh, Western infringement upon Russian interest, that, that the, the expansion of NATO and the expansion of the EU was seen as a direct threat, and he believed that the Europeans had only done this because Russia was weak, and he was there to tell us that Russia is no longer weak. It's an alien perspective to us, but it's still the Russian perspective. Hmm. Uh, the EU's policy towards Ukraine, as it stands now, is one of for the lack of a better word, co-opting. By slowly, slowly building brick on brick, we will get to the point where Ukraine is, uh, if not a full-blown EU member, then perhaps something akin to Norway or to Turkey, semi-integrated. Se semi the problem to the EU, and this is a problem that I think that has not been recognized in Brussels, is that this is exactly what Putin does not want. He sees mm -hmm. EU expansion as a thin edge of the wedge, where EU goes, NATO is sure to follow, and then suddenly Russia will have NATO directly on its, on its inner borders. So how to read Russia? That is, that is, the, uh, is 
a part of the problem within the West. Bob Jervis wrote this brilliant book back in 1976 called Perceptions and Misperceptions. And the book is about countries such as Russia, countries that act ag aggressively in international politics, how to read them. And he finds that there are two kinds of aggressive powers. One that is genuinely feeling threatened and feeling that they're running out of options and lash out in order to to show strength in, a, in, a, in what they believe, uh, experience as a very dramatic situation. The other one is the classic revisionist great power, the, the Napoleons and the Hitlers of this world, the, the, the states that are genuinely expansionist. The problem is, Jervis says, in the first category, if we're dealing with a genuinely afraid, concerned party, appeasement is the best way forth, not mm. to rattle their cage, so to speak. The problem is, if the other, the actor is a revisionist state, no compromise must be made. One must draw a line in the sand and say, if you cross it, we'll fight. The problem within the West is that we are not in agreement about what kind of power Russia is. Whilst the Europeans, led by Germany, have a tendency to see the, uh, see the Russians as a concerned, rather weak state, that, that, that we can have deals with, such as the Minsk Accords. The Americans have a tendency to see uh, the Russians as um, a, a poor revisionist state, a state that is, uh, that, that is inherently dangerous, uh, but is on the decline and, and will, will fade away with time. And so the Americans have taken the back seat. What I would like to leave you with as my, my thought for, uh, for, for this is number one. Uh, the current modus operandi uh, for European engagement with Ukraine is leading towards the frozen conflict scenario. Uh, if we make and help the status quo to remain tenable, it will prolong for a long time. And I must remind you, we have a second frozen conflict that desperately needs solving, and that's the, uh, the conflict around Transnistria. Moldova is a NATO and EU applicant state, and the Transnistrian conflict is precluding uh, Moldovan membership. It's another issue where we, uh, and we've already seen that this has lasted since 1992. I believe that the status quo is not tenable. I think that uh, the Ukrainian state cannot develop in the dire direction that it should, that the uh, citizens want, while maintaining a low intensity civil war on the long. I don't think that can happen. And the only solution that I see is to bring the Americans back in. I think the Americans have been given too easy a ride when it comes to Ukraine. I think that you're, the EU needs to cooperate and coordinate with the Americans. And I believe that an old-fashioned uh, high politics compromise m must be reached between the powers over Ukraine. Uh, that might be uh, a, what one perhaps might call a first-class Finlandization where Ukraine is allowed to free trade both with uh, the Euro Eurasian uh, trade pact that Putin is trying to put forth and with the EU. I think Ukraine deserves that, any chance they can have. Uh, but in the current situation, I'm afraid that we're going to end up with the EU coming up with very strange schemes such as this proposal to end visa regulations for the, for the Ukrainians. They offered the same to, to the Turks as well now as in the migration crisis. And one would think that would be the one thing that would not be offered in a context where the European populations are already, you know, in a state of panic over migration. To open the borders towards Ukraine and, and Turkey is probably not where you want to go right now, but that's where the EU has been going. I think the EU needs help, and I think the Americans are the ones to bring it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. <coughs> also in bringing this Atlantic dimension here, because during this conference, we haven't heard almost anything about the importance of this is a Prague European summit, but uh, uh, we could imagine that it's, it, it could be called even Prague Euro Atlantic summit because it's, this is the importance of the Americans. Would you like to respond to each other briefly and then we will open the floor to them? Mm -hmm. Maybe, okay, I'll uh, to give a, um, 
but to compliment David, maybe a little bit in giving a credit to the EU because the EU has been so much criticized here. I agree pretty much that the, the, the fact that sanctions were agreed was a very positive thing, but uh, I would like also to add EU managed to resist to the uh, attempts of Russia to revise the association agreement because this was Russia's original plan to revise it and what it managed to achieve was only to post the postponement of DCFTA part until one year and it's going to come to force as of 1st of January 2016. Also, the EU was able to react to Russia energy pressure and the reverse was quite swiftly organized from Slovakia and Hungary and Poland. Uh, so this is already a big contribution. And uh, um, EU has become uh, very much outspoken when it comes to the domestic reform process, which is not the case before. For instance, we saw recently uh, the head of the EU delegation commenting on the composition of the council, which is going to select the prosecutor in charge of corruption. Mm. And there were two, uh, three um, members of the council which were appointed, which had uh, dubious um, background. And uh, as a response, uh, as a response from the pressure from civil society and also from this letter uh, from the EU delegation, uh, two members of the council were replaced. Uh, to and the civil society members were gonna take this post. Uh, this is just one of the examples. There were many more, but of course you can do more. I would like to bring up one example. Um, there is now, for instance, a special EU advisory mission to Ukraine. It's a, uh, it's a uh, CSDP a civilian mission. And uh, I would like to draw maybe a comparison with Kosovo, because, because this mission, it has a budget of 13 billion uh, euros a, a year with uh, 100 uh, people of staff. And if we look at EU uh, LEX mission in Kosovo, it can be comparable in the sense of the missions of these missions. Its annual budget is 90 million uh, euros and 800 staff, yeah? And let's compare the population and the size of the countries, yeah? So maybe it says something about the level of commitment on the size of the EU. I think the EU has, been give, has given a lot of money to Ukraine, uh, more maybe than, more ma than before, and there is a low absorption capacity. There are cases when some ministries cannot really make a good use of this money. Uh, but still, I think this comparison gives also an idea that you maybe is not uh, committed enough and there can be more which can, more can be done. Yeah. Okay. Yes, two points. Uh, first, the DCFTA. Uh, today, Commissioner Maltström is in Kiev and she confirmed it that the DCFTA will, without any, let's say, conditions, come into power on the 1st of January 2016. And it's a milestone. Mm. It's a milestone that means that Ukraine, at the end, would be economically integrated into the single market without certain limitations to the freedom of uh, movement of uh, labor force. Yeah. But it will be, when we are talking to students, we say it's something, a model that uh, Norway and Switzerland you know, mm -hmm. are using. So that's a great failure of, uh, Russia, of Putin's uh, policy in Ukraine. Uh, that's a big defeat for them. The second thing, Euro-Atlantic cooperation and... and uh, yeah, I was just thinking how to you know, make it a bit more entertaining here. So I will tell you a few stories from our internal cuisine. That statement that Ira just quoted of our head of delegation, of course, had to be consulted with our headquarters in Brussels. And it took, um, well, one, one, one day. And uh, what I'm also running quite often are uh, sort of courses, master classes, in, informal master classes for Ukrainian journalists, how to understand EU speak. Right? It's extremely difficult. The golden rule is start reading our statements from the last sentence. That's the golden rule. Well, and what uh, we have here, that we are really working in a very close, I would say, uh, contact, in a close coordination with our uh, American colleagues. Uh, on the ground, we are very much consulting each other, agreeing uh, the task division, of course, the good cop is the EU, the bad cop is the US. So the US ambassador, I mean, when we are, for example, speaking about the conditionality of, uh, on the EU assistance, it's all based on conditionality. So our statements are running like that. The EU is ready to provide a financial assistance to Ukraine uh, under the conditions set up in the state building contract uh, memorandum of understanding, something like that. Then you have a US ambassador who come, goes public and says, no reforms, no money. Reforms, yes, there will be money. So, you know, <laughs> that's always very difficult for us to, you know, <laughs> change our kind of minds. Uh, sophisticated. Of, sophistic 
perception of reality. But it's uh, really true that we are working very closely on the anti-corruption uh, <coughs> laws, on uh, the setup of the anti-corruption national bureau. We are, of course, providing much more funding than our American colleagues. They do acknowledge that, though not publicly. We have teamed up also with them in uh, creating, uh, I would say, one of the most visible signs of reforms, and it's the creation of patrol police. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, American instructors trained the, the newly recruited people within, I think, three months, and then everybody was taking selfie with them. We call them a selfie police. But of course, these and our EU AM mission colleagues confirmed that that these people still lack basic skills yeah, yeah, yeah. because you cannot create a good poli policeman or police officer within three months. So what we are now doing. We are now training these policemen, but of course, you know, we don't take selfies <laughs> with these police officers. American ambassador did, together with the Ukrainian president, so everybody knows that these guys were trained by the US and Canadian uh, instructors. But I must say that on the ground, uh, this cooperation works pretty well. Well, thank you both for some positive views. Uh, let it be about that milestone, or let it be these concrete <coughs> examples about uh, EU, US cooperation. I think one of the great dilemma is uh, with Russia not resigning on its aims and goals and on its, uh, uh, I would say, continuous intervention in Ukrainian affairs, does it have any meaning to help Ukraine to become, uh, I would say, more more appropriate state with a more appropriate governance and everything what is connected to it, and doesn't could it help the Ukrainians even to go with that, uh, you know, either frozen conflict or however we call it? And thank you for bringing arguments in favor of this that it has a meaning to help Ukrainians. Well, floor is yours for comments or questions or. Yes, please. So first, then the second. Yes. And the third. Yes. Uh, uh, Vladimir Handel, Institute of International Relations. Uh, I would like to come back to the question of the frozen, frozen conflict. What is the alternative for the EU in terms of dealing with the war in Ukraine, the crisis in Ukraine, etc., than to drive towards some kind of frozen conflict. Do you see an unfrozen conflict, a hot conflict being an alternative? Do you think that the soft power, normative power, civilian power, whatever, EU should turn into hard power and start to engage, arming the uh, Ukrainian army, perhaps involve, being involved itself? The same question to, to, to you, because it's also, do you, do you ask for more American involvement, do you mean also involvement in terms, of, in, the, in terms of hard power involvement, except for the training of the some units, in, which is acceptable still within the framework of frozen conflict? Do you think that the, if the frozen conflict is the bad solution, so what is, what is the good solution? And, and to Irina as well, so how do you perceive it? Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that frozen conflict is a betrayal of the Ukraine? Uh, I'm not talk about frozen conflict, it's a betrayal of Ukraine interest. Or is it a, a status quo which has to be accepted for some time and, and live, with, live with it and then, uh, then uh, yeah, go over it in some, uh, hopefully, not too distant future? So, thanks. <coughs> thanks. Uh, I think it's better to have all three questions and then you can prepare your answers. Vladimir. Thank you, uh, Vladimir Bilchik. Um, a couple of questions I'd like to ask. Uh, first one is uh, maybe mainly for Irina and also David, uh, relating to uh, this idea or this notion uh, that um, in recent year and a half or so, uh, um, the nature of the Ukrainian society has changed uh, in some perhaps deep ways in terms of the uh, commitment and also identity when it comes to looking uh, to alternatives from the Soviet space and looking at the West and the EU. You concluded uh, the uh, society has been united and also it's uh, still fairly pro-European. Now, my question is basically how sustainable is this when the kind of uh, biggest examples of uh, the freedom of the change you've identified, especially Irina, uh, is in the realm of uh, freedom of press, um, uh, civil society. 
Do you see, and this is maybe a question for all of you, any qualitative change or glimpses of qualitative change when it comes to politics and economy? Uh, when you look at the uh, actors who are uh, leading uh, these realms, uh, what has been the qualitative change, which perhaps might be part of the answer, how sustainable is this uh, uh, united Ukraine around uh, the European way of doing things? That's the first issue. And the second issue is about, uh, uh, I'll get to frozen conflict here, and it's about um, uh, Kiev's uh, seriousness about uh, Minsk. We all know Minsk is hard from ideal, it's a ceasefire agreement, but, but really we have, uh, that's the thing we have on the table. How serious is Kiev about uh, Minsk? And in a sense, how serious is Kiev about uh, the territories which are sort of on the other side of uh, the new uh, border? Um, what's the thinking? What's the commitment? Uh, uh, is this something with which we are likely to see more games uh, or is there some genuine interest in uh, doing some, at least some part of uh, the Minsk uh, underlying uh, points and commitments beyond perhaps maybe the one which has so far been mm -hmm. uh, dealt with? Uh, because uh, that will in some respects also determine the nature of uh, what we see um, uh, east of uh, uh, the uh, new ceasefire line. Thank you. Okay, we have first two voices from the audience and several questions, so we will stop here and then you and you will follow, okay? So please, who would like to start? Okay, maybe I'll combine the first question about the frozen conflict and the Minsk. Um, I think, and uh, I think this is more, uh, this is, uh, this also coincides with the majority vision in Ukraine that frozen conflict would be the best case scenario actually. Uh, uh, because uh, as David mentioned, even now uh, under the conditions of ceasefire, we still have fighting taking place and uh, there are casualties. Uh, so the best case scenario would be to stop uh, for separatists to, to uh, take away the military equipment, because also there have been news that, uh, in the, uh, that they were not really removing the equipment, but were changing the location of it, yeah, uh, of the weapons. So, uh, so this would be desirable, and uh, uh, to stop casualties, to stop fighting, because we, ha we now have two, uh, two million displaced, internally displaced people, uh, uh, at least to stop here, and we have over 6,000 people who are dead. Uh, so. Um, in that case, the frozen conflict will be the best case scenario. I don't believe that would be a, there will be a possibility to restore the control over, the, over, the, over the, this um, part of the border, which is controlled by separatists, although it's also part of the implementation of the Minsk Agreement. I don't believe this is going to happen because this is a big opportunity also for smuggling, for, for uh, uh, contraband, which is taking place in big amounts and people from these territories are benefiting, I mean, these so-called separatists and also Russian authorities. So I don't see it's, it's going to happen, but at least to stop uh, an active phase of fighting, that would be the best case scenario from my perspective. Uh, so yes, I'm, um, um, implementation of the Minsk and uh, David mentioned the voting on the constitution, uh, which uh, I think it, it was, um, uh, I think Ukraine will vote uh, the, um, the uh, new version of the constitution. Uh, I, uh, unfortunately, it has been too much politicized. Uh, the uh, constitution which has been put on vote in the first round, uh, the first, 21st of, uh, of uh, August, has been prepared by a big group of experts for about, about a year, and it's mostly about decentralization. There is nothing about the status of the territories. For that, there should be a special law which will be voted later. But uh, um, for some reason, I think it was a mistake of the president. He linked the voting on the decentralization as an implementation of the Minsk agreement, whereas I think it's a separate issue. And if we look at the decentralization process, it has been happening in Ukraine for some time already. Uh, there was a new um, budgetary code, and the budget, which was uh, passed uh, in December last year for 2015, was already based on this new code, and according to this budget, parts, parts of uh, income, uh, or part, part of local taxes uh, stay on the local level. They're not being transferred to the center. And there was already a report which shows that majority of municipalities have doubled their income, yeah? So there is a posit it's, a, it's also part of the decentralization. Mm -hmm. And then after the laws to, uh, the amendments to the Constitution are passed, I hope it will still happen this year, but if not, then next year, uh, I hope there will be a communication policy which will help to separate, yeah, this process from Minsk agreement because they are basically different. Mm -hmm. uh, then uh, um, Ukraine will the fact to implement is part of the Minsk agreement and right. how it is perceived in the EU. But uh, uh, on the part of Russia, I'm, I'm very skeptical about Russia implementing its part of the agreement. And 
Um, uh, about the new way of uh, doing things, um, European way, uh, unfortunately not, this has not has happened yet. Uh, there is a lot of talk about reforms because there is a lot of demand, uh, a lot of demand and pressure. But uh, pretty much the, the, uh, the elites which are running the country now are pretty much all the elites. But there are some, I would say, enclaves of reform-minded people in the government, in the bureaucracy, and mostly, of course, in civil society. So we have several really reform-minded ministers, like the Minister of uh, Finance, Minister of Economy, um, um, they, they have a new police, actually, which was also a creature of um, a, a Georgian um, um, expatriate, can we put it this way, yeah, so the, the, the lady in Georgia who implemented the police reform there uh, in Ukraine, in, in Kiev, it, it is already function, functioning. So we have uh, these enclaves of reform-minded people, uh, and they can, they try to do things as much as they, as they can at their level and within their competence. But we don't have a government as a collegial body yeah. who, is promo who has a strategic thinking and has a strategy of promoting reforms. No, we don't have. And we have, have a lot of vested interests, which are also very close to the president and to the prime minister who block reforms. We see, we see a lot of uh, reports from journalists indicating to people from close surrounding of uh, the prime minister and the president who use uh, their um, power positions to uh, enrich themselves and to, to use um, old corrupt schemes. Uh, so uh, this is a big challenge Ukraine is fencing, facing. Um, and I hope the, this enclaves of reform-minded people will turn, turn into a critical mass over time. But I don't know how much time it might take. Yeah. Anyway, it's good to hear about critical mass. Mm. Would you like to continue? Uh, yeah. Alternative to uh, frozen conflict. I mean, if the conflict is frozen, it's frozen only for a couple of weeks or maybe a couple of months because there is a pretty clear regularity uh, between the intensity of fighting as well as intensity of these humanitarian convoys that go to Russia and the political calendar in the EU before each council's, uh, European Council's meeting, we have seen the increased number of humanitarian convoys entering Ukraine, and then we also saw an increased fighting uh, intensity of shelling from the other side. And now look what is happening. The, this sort of a, uh, recent uh, breaches of ceasefire, I don't think they are coincidental. This is mm -hmm. also sort of a creating a pressure on the EU uh, prior to this uh, council, European Council meeting where the decision on the extension of the sanctions is going to be made. So this, we, this is an open sort of a form of pressure mm -hmm. also on us. So that conflict can be defrozen, can enter this hot phase at any moment. There is one person who gives an instruction and we have a, again a hot uh, phase of the conflict. How to prevent that? And here indeed Minsk offers certain checks and balances. And we have to explore all possibilities under the Minsk agreements to reach at least the respect of the ceasefire, because nobody wants to see human people, a human being, beings dying. Uh, so, how to prevent that hot phase? Ukrainian state must become strong, including Ukrainian army. You will not fight with the so-called rebels a regular army that is professional, that is well equipped, that is well commanded, because this will be a suicide. Yeah. So that's one thing, it's not the task of the EU, it's the task for the NATO, concrete uh, member states, to help increase the military capacities of Ukrainian army, the that's army right. of a sovereign yeah. European state, I would yeah. stress. Then, <coughs> can we trust, uh, means, uh, can we trust Kiev and uh, uh, Moscow, if they want to sincerely implement the Minsk agreement, I mean, I would strictly speak on my personal behalf, uh, I would say I have doubts. I would say what we are observing is a sort of attempts to imitate the implementation. That's what I w meant by my questions. Uh, and that's pretty dangerous. And both sides are like two boxers in a clinch, and they are waiting that the other one will soon fall on the ground and will not be able to fight anymore. So there is a race of time where both sides are expecting the other one to collapse. And here, there are potential risks for the EU as well, because on the first, as, I, as it was said, on the 1st of January, the DCFTA would come in force and Russia will introduce sanctions and trade embargo on to Ukraine. And I'm 100% sure it will be accompanied by a new wave of Russian propaganda because most of the exports that go, still goes to Russia is from the eastern Ukraine-controlled territories. People there will be unemployed. 
They will lose jobs after the 1st of January. Wonderful argument. You see, now you got what, what you were jumping for jumping on Maidan. Yes, yeah. One thing. Second thing. Reforms are painful. Uh, the tariffs for gas, municipal services have been increased. The people will start receiving new bills right now in November. And the, these bills will, like, I don't know, increase a couple of times. While the real incomes have decreased in Ukraine over the, one, over the last year by 40%. And we, we, what, what we expect is that the agents of Russian influence in Ukraine will start to undermine the social and economic order from inside. Yeah. There are already social protests that are still quite, it's quite visible that they are managed. The government building is now blocked uh, by a radical party because they created a tariff Maidan. Mm -hmm. uh, they are imitating Maidan, but they now are just blocking the main street where the government is. So imagine what's going to happen after the 1st of January with this increase of Russian propaganda, uh, questioning and challenging the course that the country has chosen. It's also a question of the sustainability of these moods. Still, I don't think we have reached this critical level when uh, you know, things are irreversible. Still, we have to work a lot, and especially in the south and the east part of Ukraine, because these are the most vulnerable parts of Ukraine. There are positive changes, but I still don't think they are re irreversible. And, yeah, the best response of the EU is to help with reforms, to make Ukrainian states strong, and to have the results visible as soon as possible. <laughs> also, people are asking us how Ukraine should return Crimea back to Ukraine. Simple answer, look at what happened with Western and Eastern Berlin. Create Western Berlin in Ukraine. Make it attractive economically. Increase the living standards in Ukraine then these parts of separatist territories would come back very soon back to you. And then this sort of a domino effect would extend beyond the Ukrainian border and might reach also the eastern neighbor. That's what the eastern neighbor is also afraid of. Thank you for an excellent description of frozen conflict. So what should be done? Yeah, the, uh, the question for me was, uh, should we fight? Should we fight the Russians? Should the, uh, should the CSDP? Mm -hmm. uh, fire up their main battle With tanks the and drive them slowly towards the uh, towards no, no, no. Kursk. Uh, I think not. I don't think that is a very good idea. Uh, mainly because we would lose and we would lose big. Uh, I remind you that the Berlin Plus, Plus Agreement is a one-way street where the EU gets access to uh, to NATO assets, uh, but it doesn't work the other way around. I don't think that uh, that the EU, if they chose to militarize the the conflict, that they could. Uh, assume that the full re resources of NATO would behind, be behind them on this score. Uh, I, I think, and this is one of the, the things I find most depressing in our current times, is that it seems to be uh, a lessened appreciation of the value of peace uh, in, in Europe today. Uh, peace is by far the biggest achievement of European integration. Uh, and I think that rather than thinking in terms of war, we should be thinking in terms of peace. And, uh, and going back on this, you know, the, the question about how deep have the reforms in, uh, ongoing in Ukraine, how deep have they been? Well, it's an incre incredibly contradictory picture. In some ways, Ukraine actually resembles Russia quite a lot with powerful oligarchs and a rather uh, dysfunctional uh, political system with a perhaps too powerful pre precedent on top of it. And on the other side, you s we see a lot, of, a lot of really positive developments, mostly further down in the, in the system, to my mind, as well. Uh, the Americans uh, were toying with the idea of giving the Ukrainians uh, uh, anti-tank anti weapons, which is sort of the, the big, one of the big problems in eastern Ukraine, because uh, the Russians have parked a lot of, uh, a lot of main battle tanks there, and, they're difficult to, to deal with for the Ukrainians. And the Americans have so far chosen not to do what they've done in Syria. In Syria, they've given these weapons to mm -hmm. the rebels. Uh, in Ukraine, they have not. Uh, I don't think uh, that the Americans will, will change this policy. Uh, but I do think uh, that if uh, there was a sit down between uh, the main leaders of Europe and the United States and Russia, to flesh out an agreement about how the, the peace in Europe can be maintained in the, long, in the long run, I do think that it is necessary 
to impress upon the Russians uh, in terms that they do understand uh, that their behavior towards Ukraine cannot stand and it will not stand and it's not uh, an acceptable way of treating your neighboring countries. And I think that uh, on behalf of the Russians, I think they really need re that <laughs> reminder after having run war games against Estonia and against Norway in the past year. Uh, this is very un uh, uh, unfriendly and it's very unhelpful and it seems that Russia, of all countries, um, should be uh, volunteering to walk down the path towards war is, is baffling and I think that it would be uh, helpful to remind them uh, that there are costs to be paid even for, for this kind of policies. Okay, thanks. So we will have two more questions, uh, or, or three, but we, well, we are asked to end at quarter to one. I hope we will be allowed to prolong it a bit, but if you, if you could kindly, uh, yes, if you could kindly, uh, I mean, shorten your test, test. comments. Or uh, yes, my name is Henry Laser. I'm actually an American uh, based in Brno at Masaryk University, and uh, I agree with the panelists in terms of how to deal with Putin's frozen zone policy in Georgia, in Moldova, now in Ukraine. Um, that's an issue for uh, defense and diplomacy. My question is, how can we strengthen the interior and the civil society and the small and medium enterprises and the media and the rule of law in Ukraine so that the state is not vulnerable when you talk about rule, when you talk about sovereignty, when you talk about international law, vibrant states are easily, uh, are non-functional non states are easily um, violated that way. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm interested in how we are strengthening, as our panelists had called for, and um, the two panelists who are involved in the media, my particular interest is, can you give examples and what is the EU doing to strengthen the transparency and the diversity and the independence of media in the Ukraine and in the frozen zone? Yes, please. First you. <clears throat> uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Martin Povacio. I'm the Czech Prem Rep in, uh, in the EU. Uh, and I have one short comment and one, one question. Uh, the comment is as follows. Uh, the lack of policy uh, of the EU vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and vis-a-vis -vis Russia is a straight consequence of the EU disunity. EU members have different interests in Ukraine and they follow them and the result is the uh, minimum common denominator that uh, we, we have. Yet, I still consider a, a miracle that within three weeks the EU will adopt quite robust, solid and well-targeted sanctions against Russia as a response. But we cannot expect the EU uh, to develop a coherent policy vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine and Russia uh, if uh, we do not change our mindset and start thinking geopolitically. That we will not do until the geopolitical pressures on Europe increase yet another time. My question is uh, the following. It is my feeling that uh, over the past year, more or less, the reform drive, the reform endeavor, the reform commitment of the Ukrainian authorities weakened. Uh, why do I think so? Because I, I hear every time more often that the Ukrainian administration asks uh, foreigners or foreign uh, actors to help them handle their own political process. My question to either Irina or David uh, is, do you have the same feeling? And if so, how do you explain it and what can be done uh, to fix it? Thank you. Thanks. Yes. And now the third. Uh, hello, uh, Vid Benesh, Institute of International Relations. I have a provocative question. 
what we have heard is that we need some kind of policy towards Ukraine, we need a policy towards Russia, but it does, and we need to fr really freeze the conflicts in order to prevent them to get hot. Uh, does the EU have policies towards these frozen areas, like Transnistria? Do we have policy towards this region? It seems to me that uh, we, uh, we, we see them simply as some black holes, lost cases, mm -hmm. uh, terra incognita. Uh, uh, and we simply assume that there are already Russian territories. Uh, mm -hmm. Why don't we try to uh, give them more money than Russians do? Why don't we try to, uh, I don't know, build a pipeline so that they are not dependent on Russian gas? Why don't we treat Transnistria the same way we treat Kosovo? Kosovo is not recognized as an independent country by all EU member states, but still we are able to do something there and work with them. And I think Transnistria is really important. Uh, the, the Donbas separatists, uh, they do not care about Ukraine. If Ukraine is successful, it, uh, it will not be a model for them, but they look to Transnistria as a model. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that if Transnistria enters the EU, that will be the, the game changer for, for Donbass. Well, thank you very much. We have active audience topics for next two conferences. Maybe. <clears throat> anyway, please, would you like to start? First question on the support of the independent media or media, let's say, plurality. I I'm really pleased and honored that I'm, for example, working on the team of the EU team that is helping to create a public broadcasting service in Ukraine. We have passed the law. We helped to pass the law. We are now uh, training journalists. We are now... Uh, paying for uh, advertisement, outdoor advertisement, because the state TV has lost its audience, the rate, the audience is like 2%, so we are now trying to help them also with the content, with the uh, visibility and recognition. There was a network of uh, independent uh, TV stations called Hromatske, uh, Civic TV. We provided two years support, 900,000 uh, euros, not for the central office, but to the regional uh, offices. These journalists on the ground are doing civic journalism, they investigate local corruption cases, they look into the behavior of local, let's say, authorities and local feudals. Uh, then we have provided the funding also for certain uh, law preparation of certain laws, like the law on media transparency, which is extremely important. All media in Ukraine, the oligarchic channels are owned through uh, offshores, through the Cyprus, so the law is forbidding this uh, sort of ownership. Uh, all the uh, media holdings have to disclose the ownership structure, which is important because the largest TV channel, the, f the, the inter TV channel, has 26% of share of uh, Russia public broadcaster, for example. Hmm. These are like rumors because it's all done through the offshore. So now this will be banned and will have to be disclosed. So we are helping to clean the media, uh, media legislation, for example, and we support these islands of uh, independent journalism, for example. Uh, the permanent request from Ukrainian authorities to help uh, with, with funding, yes, <laughs> that's a kind of a traditional question that we get at almost every meeting. And sometimes there are like really, I would say, anecdotal situations when the Ukrainian, for example, Ministry of Economy asked for 200,000 euros to run a website-based uh, public procurement uh, platform. We asked them, don't you have a money in the, the budget of your ministry? They said, yes, we do. But the procedures to get that money are so complicated, so it's easier to get mm -hmm. it from you. Uh, the other counter-argument that we often use, like, yeah, we are asking us for uh, the macro financial assistance. We still are about to pay 1.2 billion euros. Uh, but how come that the state enterprise, Ukrnafta, which is controlled by one of the oligarchs, which is the state enterprise, still owes the state, the budget of the state, in dividends, almost the same amount. So why we should you know, put there our money if the state is not able yeah. to execute these liabilities from own oligarchs? So that's, that's true, we hear it almost everywhere, but I wouldn't say that the EU reform drive has weakened, uh, maybe at the level of uh, elites or so-called elites, because these elites, so-called elites, are threatened, are endangered by these reforms, so there is a hesitance. But I would say they are in a defensive position because there is a pressure mainly from within the country exactly. and as well from outside. 
Yeah. Well, yes, thanks. Yeah, I'll be short. I pretty much agree with the point that uh, uh, much of the problem why Ukraine is so uh, vulnerable to Russian pressure is because Ukraine is a weak and dysfunctional state. I agree. And, and, there are, and uh, at this level, things have to be tackled, and this is what the EU has to be done. How to do it is a big task. I cannot give a recipe, of course. But I think the EU has to increase pressure. It has to increase its um, level of uh, mandling into domestic affairs of Ukraine, if you want, to comment more on what is happening in the parliament and in the government, to comment if uh, some reforms are obviously being blocked by some vested interests. I think it's very important to have this external pressure stronger. Uh, so this is what the EU has to do. Um, um, Right. I, I haven't quite got what... Did you mean that Ukraine is kind of saying Western actors to stay away, or...? Um, I was not quite sure what was your question, but... Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and that they, every, every time more often, turn to EU, uh, EU member states to help them convince other political actors on the domestic scene uh, to push reforms uh, through, let's say, Verkhovna uh, Rada. Mm -hmm. uh, thus, replacing their own role in the political proce process by uh, actors from the outside. That's my point. No, but I agree. I mean, uh, unfortunately, this is the case. There are different actors, and uh, some actors block reforms, and they will continue doing so, and they have a lot of powers. Uh, David mentioned one oligarchs, there are others, right? And, uh, and there are actors who want to change something. I think the EU has to really enforce those actors who want to change something. I mean, there is no other way... Uh, to help to change things. You cannot impose something from outside, but if you follow the processes closely and uh, tries to enhance those trends and those actors who want to change something, then there is a way. Uh, otherwise, uh, I don't see a solution. Okay. Yeah, the, the question about uh, EU disunity as a, as a result of actual disunity amongst the 28 member states, I think you're absolutely right uh, that uh, there is not uh, common ground about the end game concerning Ukraine and therefore uh, we have a lot of discrete policies uh, that lack the overarching uh, strategic uh, framework about what they are uh, supposed to to achieve. Um, you're also right when you say that uh, geopolitics have a tendency to sort of arise amidst crisis. The problem currently when it comes to the EU is that uh, in the context of the refugee crisis, uh, I think that a, a renewed crisis in Ukraine would fracture the EU. I don't think it would unite the EU. And uh, that places uh, the European Union at, at great disadvantage. And we're stuck with the Minsk process that is leading towards a frozen conflict scenario. And what Benesch said about uh, Transnistria, I think, is, is spot on. I think that, uh, that Transnistria is something that we have gone on to forget. Mm. Uh, we have made uh, resolving the Transnistrian crisis a criteria for EU accession for, uh, for Chisinau, knowing full well that the key to res resolving this crisis lies in Moscow, not in, in Moldova, which is kind of unfair. And we have been engaging in tit-for-tat uh, sanctions in Moldova, where, on the one hand, Moldova uh, blocked uh, gas deliveries to Transnistria, Transnistria, uh, Transnistria uh, uh, blocked exports of wine and fruits from Moldova into, uh, into Ukraine, uh, and it's just, just hugely unhelpful, and I do, I do think you're right, because uh, the Russians haven't been showing Transnistria a lot of love either. Uh, so I think relatively small policy initiatives uh, of being generous, basically, towards Transnistria could 
uh, actually bring about in the long term the desired outcome, and that is the reu reunification of Moldova. Uh, but I think in the short term, uh, to bring Transnistria, which is some sort of a Russian exclave currently, mm. uh, into uh, the region where it's actually geographically located, uh, would be beneficial. And I think this is one of the re areas where the current modus operandi of the EU could actually do a gr oh, well, uh, much more good than it's currently doing in Ukraine. Well, thank you so much. As you can imagine, I'm, I'm receiving uh, envelopes and, and reminders <laughs> simply to, to conclude this panel. Uh, one of the contributions of this conference is that the organizers are able not only to invite uh, uh, excellent speakers and to invite great audience, but also to prepare policy papers like this one by Europeum uh, Institute for European Policy. And I think the title is quite, quite appropriate. Ukraine, no shortcuts on the long road ahead. So please, those of you who didn't have time and opportunity to look at it, it's worth of looking and studying. And thanks for a very active and vivid audience and for our great speakers. And uh, that's all for this morning. Thank you very much.